This podcast contains potentially adult language, adult themes, definitely drinking, and possibly sexual context. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Drinking with Authors, the podcast. I am your host, Erica Lance. My co-host today is the amazing Danielle Orsino. Thank you, Erica. And please don't forget to like and subscribe and leave us a review because we're sure that you have lots to say about our podcasts. Exactly. And our amazing guest today is Rob Volpe. <laughs> Yay, thank you. Erica I'm Daniel. dying to get a studio audience, by the way. I might just find neighbors and pay them to sit over here and just cheer. Here. And they'll be you like get a soundboard. Yeah, what are you doing? What are you... <laughs> soundboard. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's talk about what we're drinking. So I am oh, drinking yeah. some white Ooh. dragon 70% organic. This thing makes me laugh all the time. It's 70% organic Riesling. 70%. 70%. Ooh, Riesling. It literally you says just, 70% Riesling. You just elevated organic. Riesling. Like you just oh, went yeah, up. No. Look, I'm in my dinosaur shirt. I'm super fancy today. Fancy today. Very fancy. Ooh. And Danielle, what are what are we what are we doing today? In in my unicorn goblet, I'm, I'm getting more goblets, by the way. I'm going with barefoot fruscato watermelon. You see, I've dropped the apple and we're going watermelon today. Is so that very good? fancy? Because watermelon can be mm -mm. this tastes like real watermelon. It's not oh, like that artificially watermelon. It's like, yeah. it's got that little tart of watermelon. So no, we're good. So it's, it's like wine with watermelon essence in it. Basically it's a wine cooler, but shh, we're, wow. we put it in a, but since they put it in a bottle, we're calling it wine, but it's really like a wine cooler, but okay. Yeah, sure. Bare, barefoot. Yeah. It's wine. Yeah. yeah. Today the kids call that white cloth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like we went from wine coolers that we all drank, like the Seagram's little ones and Zima to right wine with yeah oh. with fruit essence okay so i had to explain what zima and bartles mm -hmm. and james was to my now i say Thank my you. kids my kids are now 23 and 26 but i had to explain this to them and they kept going what and i'm like it's like a pepsi brand but it was an alcohol it's like white claw that's what exactly my daughter's like, daddy, it's white claw it's yeah, white claw and, before white claw and she's like it was seltzer and i'm like i'm not doing this with you it's a prequel. I was like, I can't. It's a prequel. A White Claw is a reboot of the Bartles and James uh, <laughs> and the Zima. Let's just. Exactly. They would have Although Zima always tasted like flat Sprite to me. I don't know why. I know it was bubbly. Oh, you have to do a blueberry schnapps with it. You do a shot oh, of blueberry schnapps that, in it. No. And then, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. We did it up. We, we I was, like at that. that time, I was also a SoCo girl. So. Oh, you are hardcore. Days. Not proud of those days. Okay, Rob, what are you drinking that's not anything we just discussed? Well, I, <laughs> I have two different drinks. Uh, so I have two, I, I'm double fisting, I guess, today. So nice. I five uh, to that. I yeah, it. really. Uh, he's in. <laughs> and so, okay, this first uh, lovely beverage is an empathetically intense rye smash. So it has rye and ginger liqueur in it, uh, a little bit of lemon and maple syrup. Uh, so that's lovely. And then this is an empathetically intense uh, mezcal margarita. Very I'm nice. I'm really so jealous right now and feel like my 70% yeah, really. organic Riesling is not living up to any of the requirements here today. I don't know, that's, that's, that's pretty good. You and Riesling though, I'd say that's, that's elevated. You know what? I, I would like a lot less. No, that's true. Never mind. I was <laughs> going to say less judgment, but we all know where we're at on that. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> For this amazing audience who hopefully just took what you said, paused the podcast, <laughs> and made it, because that's amazing. And I'm going to have to do this myself. What do you write? What do I write? I wrote a book about empathy, speaking of judgment. Um, and <laughs> so. Beautiful segue. My first book just came out. Uh, it's called Tell Me More About That, Solving the Empathy Crisis, One Conversation at a Time. Uh, so I write nonfiction. I write about people's stories. I write about my experiences and help um, using narrative storytelling. I try to help people learn about 
empathy and making different choices when they're about to be judgmental or they're going to ask a question the way that they frame up the question, um, just to try to make the world a better place one conversation at a time. Wow, that's beautiful. and that's just amazing. I had I was very fortunate. I got to meet you at ALA, which is the American Libraries Association conference for those paying attention. And since it's early enough before we drink too much, people might remember that. Um, but is this the first book you've ever published? It is. It is actually my very first. I'm a, I'm a, no longer a virgin publisher. No longer a virgin. We appreciate that. We appreciate that. Cheers to that. Um, drinks. I was going to say, let's drink to that. <laughs> so when did you start writing, though? Because for you to have a nonfiction book, you this is not the beginning of this story. So let's go scuba doo back to the beginning. All the way back to the beginning of this book or just all the way back to the beginning? All the way back. We're all going all the, the way, way back. back. And we'll come forward. Okay. Okay. So there was a there was a writing. I mean, writing's always been uh, something I've just gravitated towards as a, a form of communication. And I remember, um, I think I was in third grade. Um, there was a writing contest that where our school was participating in. And I wrote... Um, a story. I don't think I would have called it a children's story, but now for, as an adult, I would look at it and go, that's a children's story. But it was called uh, A Mouse's Eye View of Life in the White House. I was inspired. In third grade, you wrote this? Yeah. Yeah. That's it was impressive, pretty, I, man. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and it was the story about these two mice that live in the White House, um, I think it was during the Carter administration, so it was in the late 70s. And, and I think I was inspired because Amy Carter, uh, the president's daughter, was relatively young when she was there. So it was this idea of there's a kid living in the White House. And then I think through the Disney animated movies of the time, The Rescuers and things like that, mm -hmm. there were um, mice as characters and, and action heroes. And so I was like, ooh, that would be kind of cool. What would it be like to be mice in the White House? Um, and I wrote that um, and submitted it. I remember drawing the cover art for it. In, I'm, not, I'm a writer, not an artist of, mm -hmm. of illustration. Um, and it got an honorable mention. I mean, I got a, you know, a, a, some sort of participatory recognition from it. But that was the first thing that I've ever, I'd ever written that uh, I recall um, that got some sort of something recognized, recognized or got out there for other people to read. I think that's badass. That's badass. Oh, that's cool. Writer. So let's travel forward in time. Yes. Um, did you, you know, writing always communicated, did you want to be a writer? Or where, where did the genesis of finally getting a published book come from? Let's go there. We're going to just jump all over the time thing. We're going to be like Q from Star Trek. Let's do this. <laughs> exactly. So. <laughs> so the genesis for the book itself, um, so I, I launched um, my company, so like my day job, I have a, a marketing research firm and we do qualitative research focus groups, ethnographies, things like that. And I launched my own company in 2011 and people started saying to me like, oh, you're a CEO now, when are you going to write your book? And I was <laughs> like, with what time? I'm an entrepreneur, I'm starting something up. Um, and so I, I kind of shelved it. That was 2011. I didn't do anything with it um at that point in like 20 what was that 2014 I think I started to ponder what a book might look like um didn't go very far I was going to write something about intuition um because intuition is something that we all have but we also all ignore and we'll you know do stupid things even though our gut is telling us to do something else and i started to research it i'd like talk to a neuropsychiatrist and a couple of, of an energy healer and intuitive um but i wasn't finding myself like consumed by it like it wasn't taking over my mind where i was wanting to write nights weekends on top of you know running the company and then in 2016, I was giving a talk to a, a, market, a consumer behavior class, a marketing course um, at a university. And I you know, give the overview, this is our industry, this is what we do. And then I talk about empathy because there is an empathy crisis. And I, I want to bring that notion forward to the students so that they're you know, starting off on the right foot and hopefully 
um, you know, choosing to, to do better than, than others that have come before them. And so I'm there and I'm telling stories about when I've gone in home um, and doing in home research. So you go into strangers' homes, you know, Erica, if you were a participant, I might show up at your house and we'd hang out for two, two and a half hours. And I'd get to know you, ask you a lot of different questions. You know, let's say it might be about you know, breakfast cereal. We'd go like tour your kitchen, you show us all the food and everything. And um, a lot of, not a lot of times, but at times I would get confronted and challenged by my own judgment or I wouldn't be, you know, active and present and listening. Um, and so I was using those stories to help the students understand how to be more empathetic. And they were listening to me like slack jawed, just totally, you know, their phones were to the side, they were paying attention to me. And this little voice inside my head said, this is what you need to write. These are the stories you need to tell. And so that was like, okay, I started writing down the stories, the, the you know, it was all of my um, uh, research experiences that I would pull out at cocktail parties or dinner conversation, like you wouldn't believe what happened to me um, type things. And then I started to explore, well, why are those mine? Like, what, what, what is it about me? What does it say about me? And trying to have empathy and connect with these individuals, where were the barriers for me and, and where was that coming up? So I started writing in 2016 and it started as a result of that, um, that classroom. And kind of giving me that wow. spark of like this this is what I need to be focused on. I think that's awesome. So in my previous life, by previous, I mean before June 3rd um, of this year, I was worked as a CHRO. I did chief level human resources, people officer, they're kind of called the same thing. I can tell you the absolute number one problem that I found with most managers and most people is empathy. Yeah. Is they don't actively listen and they really get sympathy confused with empathy sometimes Yes, if yeah. they even pull off any sort of emotion towards a person. And especially the higher level you go as an executive, the more this is like, I, I, I'm, I'm working person. on a book myself about forgetting about like when you're this high level executive, forgetting what it's like to actually work as yeah. a worker bee and yeah. not with the title CEO, so don't get me wrong, because I'm CEO of my publishing company now, but there's something that gets forgotten sometimes. And remembering, like I remember sitting around a, a table having a conversation about health insurance and saying, you know, the family level health insurance costs $1,000 a month. And everybody's like, well, that's not a big deal. And I'm like, do you make $40,000 a year? Because if you all want to win back phones deal. right now, let's do some math. Can we yeah. do this together? And they were like, oh. And I was like, yeah. Why am I explaining this to anyone? Like, that's how it felt. Yeah. No, it's 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 true. And it's sad. There's something that I mean, there's a lot of things that have happened in the way we as a society have um told young men and women how they're supposed to behave and what it means to be a leader. And it's this very kind of madmen stereotype, unemotional um, role, you know, gender, a lot of gender role playing. Um, and where is the room for, for empathy? And it's, you know, the pandemic and Erica, I don't know if you would attribute it to the pandemic in particular, but that sudden shift and then the great resignation that's been following, you know, a lot of that was coming about because there was this lack of empathy that managers weren't, and it's not even emotional empathy. It's not a, necessarily the feeling the feelings. It's the cognitive empathy. It's understanding where I'm coming from. And your example of like health insurance at a thousand a month when I only make 40, which means my take home is maybe 28 if I'm lucky. Like, and then you've just taken half of that and, and not being able to just understand and put yourself into their shoes and see what it might be like from them that's cognitive empathy that's perspective taking the, that that skill the ceos and leaders like you just you forget that and it and, and it's been lacking in our society and so all of a sudden when parents were suddenly at home 
working and had their kids doing cartwheel wheels in the background, or they had cats meowing or dogs mm -hmm. barking. Not every manager was like, hey, are you okay? What's going on back there? Do you need to take a minute? It was more like, no, we've got to keep going. And so as a result, employees weren't feeling supported. And so when they had the opportunity, they're like, I'm out of here. And so we had, you know, for a year, we had record high resignation rates. Um, oh, it's still that way. They're just not talking about it anymore. It's yeah. it's still that way. And I, I think it's Fair true. Enough. And what I think is interesting too, oh, we're on such a different topic than writing, but what I, I love these conversations. What I think is interesting too, is that um, I found when it came to this area and empathy, that the generation that people you know, the millennials, which I don't use as a bad word ever. And I always have to say that because people tend mm -hmm. to use that as a bad word and it's not. Yes. I actually love that they don't give a shit about a gold watch at the end of retirement and are like, yeah, I don't have to do this. Like, I don't need this. I can go do something else. Yeah. And I talk, uh, I used to talk a lot about like people were surprised that all of a sudden, you know, fast food went from minimum wage jobs to like the Sonic down the road from me in rural North Carolina is paying $21 an hour. Wow. wow. 17 to $21 an hour. They can't staff because a lot of the customer service hospitality facing people mm -hmm. got probably the worst hit in the pandemic by how everyone else was treating them. Like I saw yes. staff just get ripped apart. The ones willing to show up in a restaurant to service people, even though they, you know, had to close off a third, you know, third, two thirds of the restaurant, they're there and people are being shitty. Like, I'm like, you don't understand. These are the people that have now gone home, stopped paying for childcare, doing whatever and figured out, hey, I can take a customer service job and make money sitting at home and be with my family and I don't have to put up with your crap. Right, right. And, and there's, an interesting thing happening now too. I'm so we've got the great resignation, um, and I have a thought piece coming out soon um, about the great unionization that's happening. And now all of a sudden, yes. you've got Starbucks, Apple, Trader Joe's, and Chipotle. All of their all of them are facing stores unionizing. Um, just the other day mm -hmm. in Minneapolis, Trader Joe's had a store vote to go union, and it's not the yes. first one. Starbucks has more than two hundred stores. That are now represented by unions and when you and it's it's fascinating because it, when you read you know kind of the company perspective on it and unions are bad and all of that you know it, they're afraid of the well we're a family we've you know so collective and supportive but then when you read the stories and the quotes in the media about the people the employees the frontline workers effectively mm -hmm. they're all talking about what's basically the lack of empathy from management, whether it's the store manager or leadership at the at headquarters, of really understanding what the employees are looking for, which is like, yeah, it's great you're paying me $21 an hour to work at Sonic, but if you're only giving me 10 hours a week or 15 hours a week, I still got to have another job. I can't make, I can't pay the bills off of that. And, and there's that need for flexibility that companies have and you know they i understand they want part-time work uh workers so that they can ebb and flow as needed but you need to have a base of employees that can actually make a living wage because not everybody is going to be happy at 20 hours or 30 hours a week they need to be able to make more and i think that's the great miss that the uh employers are, are having they're not listening to what the employees are truly saying because they could leave their job. They're choosing not to. They, they're they invested. They want to stay. They want to work at Starbucks or Apple or any of these companies, but they want to be able to make a full-time salary or wage out of it. You know, give me 35, give me 40 hours a week so that they can commit and dedicate to it. I think it also goes for healthcare though, as well. I mean, yeah. I've, I've seen it as a nurse. I, I was a nurse. Um, I know that even going through the nursing program, I came from a phenomenal group of women uh, who taught my nursing program. Believe it or not, empathy, it's, it's weaved into the lessons, but you would think there's actually a core lesson on empathy and there's not. It's, it's, you know, it's just kind of assumed 
yes. that we have that skill. But you would kind of think that, especially in healthcare, it would be taught. We are taught active listening and we are taught the different listening blocks and communication blocks, uh, that there is a lesson, you know, a core competency. But there is not a single, you know, curriculum facet on empathy. And considering in healthcare, there should be, and I faced it a lot uh, going through a PA program, that empathy is not taught. It's not even something that's really spoken of. It's just woven in to the curriculum and assumed you know it as healthcare. And I can say that I witnessed a lot of nurses and a lot of the healthcare providers that I was like, um, do, do you know that you're dealing with a human being? Like that, that, that person is alive, you, like touch them. You know what I mean? Like, and it, it's, it's kind of, something? yeah, yeah, it's kind of scary as you talk about this, that I understand from a management perspective, which yes, there's an issue, I think in healthcare with how we treat our nurses and our yeah. healthcare workers, uh, which from a whole other perspective is basically our, how we teach medicine in general, there's an issue. Um, but just how we teach how to interact with human beings yeah. is a problem, especially from the healthcare perspective. And part of it is, is, you know, then we get into the whole insurance and all that stuff, but it, it's just not something that's taught like your book. I would think something like that would be required reading from, for a nursing school, from, from a medical assistant, you know, something like doctors, yeah. you know, just, Hey, you got to have empathy. I've heard, I've heard the doctors in a med, med school, they have like a half a day seminar on empathy or presentation in all of the medical school training that they do. And that's it. And it's, it's like that. empathy forms the basis of your providing and, and your patient care and the way that you communicate. And to your point, the way you're interacting with each other and with your patients in particular. And well, in, in sorry, HR, I'm just saying, like, they don't teach. I taught my people empathy as an HR professional because I'm like, hi, this is cute and we can go whatever, but that's a human and there's something wrong with that human. So why don't you go find out what's wrong with that human, regardless of what they did, and then mm -hmm. let's see what we can do. Because, you know, especially an employee, I think a lot of people, oh, I'm getting such a tangent here, but we're going to go back to writing. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize an employee can be with you longer than some of your relationships in life, longer yes. than some of your marriages. So life is going to happen to that employee throughout their time period. No matter how great of an employee they are, they're going to go through relationship issues, kid things, mm -hmm. possibly family death. things, pet things, death. So they are not going to be so smiles and sunshines the entire time they're working for you. And if you have no empathy, you're screwed. Like, and that's why HR seems to be such an asshole area. And I hate that because you, you almost go, I'm protecting myself from the employees. And I'm like, yeah, they're the reason you're here. So maybe get your ass outside your office and go talk to them. Maybe yeah. we try that as a concept. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I gave a talk this morning to an organization about, I give presentations and lectures and whatnot. And I was giving one this morning about empathy and go through, I demystify it because there's a lot of confusion around it, what it is and what it means, and then get into the five steps, which is what the book um, brings to life. And then I talk about practicing empathy, especially in such a diverse environment that we live in. And, you know, 30, 40 minute conversation, there was a good 25 minutes of questions and conversation amongst the 30 or so attendees. It was really um, uh, impressive how much they held on to it and then, you know, took that and, and started talking because they want to show up more empathetically for each other. And, you know, and it's revealing sort of, sort of blind spots that we have when we're making assumptions about other people. And it's like, not everyone feels the way that you do. So, you know, or has the same belief system and you need to be sensitive to that. And empathy can help you do that. Do you think social media has done that? has in a way numbed our sense of empathy? Or do you think that it has perhaps increased our quick to judgment, our snap judgment status? So great question. Um, yes, and. So yes, empathy has been diminished by a lot of different things. Social media is definitely one of them. But even before that, just technology, all the screens that are available, the relationships we have with those screens, 
you know, you're even back, you know, when we were younger and you were tethered to your video game, to the, the console, to the TV, you might have your buddy over and you'd be sitting side by side on the sofa playing a video game, but your interaction was actually with the screen. It wasn't truly with your, your friend. You weren't having mm -hmm. empathy building experience the way you might if you were running around in the backyard role playing Wonder Woman or, you know, cops and robbers or whatever. You knew I was doing that. I, I was. He does. Cosplay, <laughs> Wonder Woman. Wonder. That's hysterical. I don't know how you picked up on that, but Rob, well done. Well yeah. done. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, so yeah, so social media, technology, um, globalization, quite honestly, like I, I think to a certain extent, we're, I don't, I think we're challenged to have empathy because we're exposed to so many more people in so many different ways and people that are other versus, you know, if you think of that stereotypical 50s, 60s, white picket fence, your little neighborhood, your, your kind of world was a lot smaller. And that's changed. Um, the polarization in politics has definitely not helped. There's a lot of, and that's been going on since the 90s, where it's this real... Mm -hmm you know, zero sum game, us versus them, winners, losers, I'm going to block all of your legislature because you're going to be a one term, whatever. And so that hasn't helped. Um, and then even the media and um, reality TV, which again, it's all about competing against each other. There's one winner and you're, you're doing whatever you can to be better than somebody else. So that it, it so all of those things are happening and we are not making the conscious choice to do differently. We're just getting sucked into the slipstream and getting onto Twitter and like, you know, bashing along with everybody else. And, and you do have to stop and say, wait, how do I want to show up? How do I want to participate um, in this conversation or in this engagement with somebody? And, and it takes work. And it's sometimes path of least resistance is just to, you know, glom on I, I think um but there's so so danielle it's a great question yes social media um has made it easier for us to jump in the anonymity in a lot of social media makes it really there's no repercussions um with some of the the different platforms and all those other factors it's all kind of created the stew of um, empathy decline and it's been going on for decades um there's the the kind of, yeah, I told you the inspiration for writing my book, the thing that got me really going about empathy, not only from my own childhood, which I write about in the book and some of my experiences growing up in small town, Indiana, but um, as an adult in 2010, I saw a story about a study that came out of the University of Michigan. And that found, they did a meta-analysis of 76 universities from 1979 through 2009. And they found, from, 2000, from 1979 to 2001, a 40% decline in people's ability to see the point of view of their classmates. 40% decline yeah. from 79 to 2001. And then it stayed at that reduced level the last eight years of the study. And then data that from Ignite360, my company, we did a study at the beginning of the year and we found that nearly one third, we asked that exact same question, can you easily see the point of view of other people? And nearly one third of American adults could not agree with that statement. And it's like, yeah, exactly. It's like, oh my God. One third of the people you're going to run into today cannot easily see your point of view. They can't ca get to a place of empathy. And that's a problem. And that was a real alarm for me in 2010 when I first heard about the uh, collegiate study. And it was like, we've got to do something about this because those people are now in the workplace and they're, you know, having kids and families and they're participating in their communities and they don't have as much empathy. And, you know, you just see it continue to get worse and worse as, as time goes on. Well, and this is wow. an awkward point to take a break, but we're going to do that. It's going to be awkward and we'll be right back with Drinking with Authors. Sample locally sourced, quality distilled spirits in the beautiful Columbia River Court at Skunk Brothers Distillery. We're family owned, brewing small batch grain to bottle spirits, just like our grandfather did back in the Prohibition era. From handcrafted bourbons and moonshine to flavored blends and cordials infused with local fruit. Join us for a tasting tour and buy Skunk Brothers spirits straight from the source. 
It's all in the family at Skunk Brother Spirits, located in Stevenson, Washington. Okay, we're back. And I feel like we could talk for literally hours on this topic and no, we can. Let's talk a little bit more about your writing though, because we are okay. drinking with various authors, you know, on this podcast. Um, so nonfiction, you wrote a fiction story about mice yes. all the way back in third grade. Yeah. And now fast forward, you wrote a nonfiction book, but you have a marketing company which is amazing. By the way, I've heard of your marketing company in my previous world. Yes, I've heard of Ignite 360. Absolutely. Okay. Wow. Good things. Good things. When you nice. said that, I was like, oh my God, I've heard of this company. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> but what what was your publishing journey like to get this book out? Because that's got to be an interesting tale. Yeah. So um I started writing in 2016 and I was, I, around that same time, um, I got introduced to a uh, long story, but I got introduced to a woman from South Africa who had worked in publishing over in the UK. And she laid out for me, like, here's the wonderful world of publishing as it exists today. And you've got the traditional publishing route and the Simon and Schuster's Penguin, et cetera. You've got the self-publishing on Amazon, whatever, and sell it out of the back of your car. And then you've got this hybrid world that's evolving and developing. And she, I, I was really intrigued by this idea of hybrid because I wasn't sure if a mainstream publisher would pick up the book necessarily. I wasn't. The one thing she said to me that's resonated and I continue to pass on to other authors is that you know, hey, if they get the latest sort of White House tell all, they're going to vote. They need to focus on the big bestseller list that they've got coming up. So don't, mm -hmm. you know, you may, you, they may love your book, but if they've got a million copy bestseller on their hands, they're going to put all their energy behind that because it's their business and what they have to do. And I, I totally understood that, but I was like, well, crap, I'm not, I don't want to put this much energy and effort into writing a book to have it effectively just, you know, die on the vine. So the hybrid became really intriguing because of that amount of, um, you know, control I would have. And, and I felt like I would get out of it as much as I would put into it with time, effort, money, et cetera. And so I, in my head, I was like, that's where I'm going to go. But let me write something first and see kind of what I've got. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm going to go, I've got this whole map laid out. Now I've got to decide. Let's got to write the book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the plan is solid. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Don't know who, don't know like any of those details. That's down the road. But I got the rest. But I got the rest. So I started writing in 2016 and like in fits and starts because I was running a company. And so I'd go through six months of a lot of writing and then a year of nothing. And then I'd pick it back up again. By the end of 2018, I had, a, I was on my fourth draft. And I had what I felt was a pretty solid, like I, I was secure enough to share it with some people. And so that was still, you know, kind of friends, family, two degrees of separation at most and asked them for feedback, um, which I got by early 2019, really helpful, useful stuff. Um, and then work out really busy. And so I did nothing. And then I was going to, uh, so I love, um, I'm a fan of grand gestures and big sorts of things. So when I finished the first draft, friends of mine have a cottage in Wales and they graciously let me use their cottage for two weeks so I could be a writer and come and review mm -hmm. and read the first yeah. draft and edit and do whatever. And, you know, I just had all those romantic notions in my head of mm -hmm. the pipe that I don't smoke and the jacket I don't have and meaningful walks. Uh, <laughs> the yep. Countryside. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. With oh, the yeah. shepherd type oh, yeah. dog that brings you random sticks so you can throw them and yes, have yep. brilliant the thoughts. Thing. Like, exactly. Inside yeah. as I talk, is it? Dust the sick. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so anyway, I did go to Wales and worked on the book there. So in 2020, because the other problem with me is if I am connected in any way, I'm going to be online checking email or I can't keep my, I can't, I don't have that self-control. Can't separate. Right. Yeah. So I need to go far away. 
And one of the things that we got to do in 2018, we did a crossing on the Queen Mary too, from London to wow. New York. Yeah, wow. With like, it was amazing, highly recommended, love it. And it was a great time to just like write because there's, you know, oh, look, there's water. Like there's no land, yeah. no shore excursions, you know. So I got a lot of writing done and I really liked that just isolating myself so that all I could do was focus. And there's an even longer voyage than the seven day transatlantic crossing. And that is a trip from Cape Town, South Africa, up to Southampton in the UK. And it's like 18 days, 14 of which are in at sea. And it was going to stop at Namibia, which is, you know, to see those sand dunes is like on my mm -hmm. bucket list of must sees before I pass. Um, and so I booked that. It was the first week of April and COVID hit. And so oh. that Hashtag obviously... tried Ireland twice. Every time I actually three times, every time I booked an Ireland trip, COVID hit, Delta hit, Omni hit. I was yeah. like, I'm not booking trips anymore. Apparently I'm You're not allowed. The You're apocalypse. Not so Ireland. I'm going to stop doing that. <laughs> Please do. Mm -hmm. I did. I stopped. I... And, and we've been good. Yes, yes, exactly. We've been fine now. Um, You're welcome, yeah. Planet Earth. As, as, <laughs> as everything was like shutting down, um, my husband was like, don't go on this trip. I don't want you gone. I want you here. I don't, you know, for so many reasons. And I'm like, I hear you. I need them to cancel on me. I psychologically, I can't cancel this trip myself. If they cancel it, that's fine. But I can't, mm -hmm. like, I, I, it was weird. I couldn't give it. And then, you know, within a week, not only did the flight cancel, the cruise cancel, the whole thing was done. And okay, fine. Um, so then it was in late 2020. And it, there was one point, actually, it was in 2018 and when I was working on the book, and I had a session. I see an energy healer here in, in San Francisco, and I was like, oh, my God, I've got to, like, you know, the book, and we need empathy, and, it, like, the things are really bad. Um, and she was like, no rushing divine timing. Just let it take its course because... <laughs> The books can let the book come out when the world needs the book yep. to come out. And, you know, sure enough, four years later, like, good Lord, who thought it could get worse? But it did. Well, again. Yeah. So um, so anyway, it was in late 2020 that I ended up I got connected to page two, which is a hybrid publisher out of Vancouver. And just Jesse Finkelstein is one of the partners and co-founders. And I just like fell in love with her as soon as we got on the, the call. It was like, she was kind of everything I imagined a publisher to be and more. Um, and so we worked through kind of what I needed and what services were going to look like. Like I did need a substantial like structural edit and help figuring out that. And it was too long and I knew that. Um, and so that was kind of our first step together. And that was beginning of 2021 and then we published that it came out february 22nd of 2022 which is super exciting that's a fun journey i mean awesome. books do come when they come and i love that you said hybrid publisher as a you know it's interesting the term hybrid publisher actually means they publish their own work as well did you know that that's what that's what that's no. the definition so oh. um and it was interesting because hybrid publisher has somewhat of a bad connotation for some mm -hmm. people, right? So like I have a publishing um, a house and, you know, people were like, well, you're hybrid. And I was like, for the longest time, I'm like, what the hell does that mean? I thought it meant we're not one of the big five. And, you know, like what the, and then I found out what it meant. And I'm like, that is the dumbest thing ever. Stop saying that. We're mid-sized publisher. That's what we're going to say from now on. Yep. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But I love that you had a great story from that because I personally believe, and the reason I started the publishing company is all of us hybrid mid-size publishers need to knock the top five off of their seats because they're doing it wrong. Amen. To your point, searching out a book, and it's great that you get bestsellers. Trust me, as a publisher, we all want bestsellers, right? Mm -hmm. But actually what I want is I want my authors to be successful. Yeah, all of them, because there's so many people to read books and so much. It's not like you get. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's some people that maybe read a book a year, but a lot of readers are vor voracious, like they gobble up books. 
Yeah. And so it's not like you're going to like oust somebody from the thing. If you go, no, we're going to stick with these five, you know, it, it, there's not that, one iron throne. There's yeah. room for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's so many, so many readers and so many different needs that readers have and things, interests and things that they want to, to learn about or explore or experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, there are two, two things that have helped me uh, appreciate the enormity of that. And one of them was an article in the New York Times about the industry. And it mentioned that only 1% of books sell more than 5,000 copies a year in retail through the traditional retail channels. I was like, 1%, oh my God, that's like tiny. And that that number of 5,000 doesn't feel like, you know. Enormous. Would you, would you like to be even more mortified that um, only less than 10% of New York Times bestselling authors actually make money off their books? Really? Yeah. Part of the reason for that is, unfortunately, and this is another status quo thing that I'm hoping to dethrone here soon, is in order to be on these lists, they don't actually accumulate book sales. Yeah. Because if they did, I hate to say it, there would be some top people that sell, but there are some self-published authors and stuff like that and smaller that would be on the top of that list Yeah. because of the volume that they sell. It's just that it, you, in order to even get on USA Today, you have to have a nomination. Then you have to get a bunch of people to vote for you to wow. be on that. And it's not based on how well you do as an author. Yeah. It is literally based on all these other things. And if they decide to do this and if they decide to like you. And I'm like, that's actually you not how grease the works, publishing world. You know, I, if I, I've, barbarians... I've, I've, yeah, I heard that. And it's not just the, it's not just USA, it's all of the lists. Are all that. of them, because I, I was, I, I, I had, I mean, I knew like the Bible, I think is like the best selling book ever and will always be, would always be at the top. But like, I, I didn't real. I thought they were legitimate, like sales, like the box oh, office they're figures. They're not. They're, they're not. not. No, it's a, it's a, it's a frame of time. It's, and a lot of times the publishing house will go in, buy the books in bulk, and then donate it to hospitals because they cannot donate to libraries. They'll donate it to hospitals, the things like that that you don't even know about. And then the author's like, hey, look, I just made, you know, New York Times. And you're like, okay, but you see the little dagger next to your name? That means it was purchased in bulk, your sales. Oh, interesting. So there's little there's little things and it means a good PR firm or it means good this. It's not always. And I learned, as Erica will tell you, I had my book when I was with my first publishing company because I switched. Uh, the publishing house was told by someone that was a client that my book was too close to their book because that author who is quite well known um, was the only Fay publisher. So they harpooned me 30 days before and published the ending to my book on Goodreads. So when what? you went and looked at my Goodreads profile, the climactic ending to my book, the whole full synopsis to the end of my book was my profile. And I had a meltdown and a half and I was calling, but because they were, they controlled my profile, I could not take it down. So I yeah. called the publicist and I was like, what's going on? And they were like, in 20 years, this has never happened. Oh my gosh, what happened, Danielle? We'll take it down immediately. Took them two weeks. But for one month before my book was launched, the ending to my book was my Goodreads profile. And, and then they, they swore they had no idea how it happened. They said the note cards for a talk show appearance got mixed up and sent to the people handling their social media. And they're so sorry. I later talked to someone in the industry, very high up, who told me it's a trick called harpooning. And that's what they do to newer authors that are about to pose a threat. Right, to an established. Um, and it, yeah. It, and, what's so yeah. funny is my point that for her Fay books, right, which are amazing, every author has a different voice. I don't care whether they're telling a similar story. I could go mm -hmm. write a story. Well, I have short stories about Fay, and they're way more graphically horrible because I'm a horror author than <laughs> Danielle is, who is more fa high fantasy. And my stories are not going to be the same. I can publish them at the nope. same time I publish Danielle's. They're audience. It's different. But unfortunately, a lot of the publishing world has a very 
icky side to it. It's kind of like yes. this year, even at ALA, I noticed a lot of the publisher had a lot of diverse books. I love that. But then I was like, what is happening? Like, are you, I hate that it's a response to what is happening and not like, cause you go and you go, oh, this is great. Here are three children's books by black authors about black children, right? But then go look at the rest of their children's catalog. Right, right. And there's mm -hmm. three of 200 books that are, you mm -hmm. know. And then what are the, how are they, are they doing anything to lift up the imprints or the publishers that are mm -hmm. already owned exactly. and have always been producing those books and how are they, they helping in that space? Speaking yeah. of exactly. empathy, there we go. Right into the empathy Exactly. How we brought Full it back circle. around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very nice. Good callback. Ah, masterful, masterful. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, um, Go ahead. What were you? Oh, saying? yeah. The only other thing I was going to say. So, there, yeah, there was that one percent, five thousand or more. Um, and I do, you know, the publisher said you're never going to get rich selling or writing a book. It's like, you know, it can be the things that come from that speaking engagements or or other opportunities. But um, the other thing was being at ALA and, you know, like walking around like it really you know, and, and for people that haven't been there, I mean, imagine a massive convention center filled with all these different publishers, some that you would recognize, others you've never heard, and each one, you know, it's like a library, like they're just books all over the place, and each mm -hmm. one's by a different author, and so talk about, and then there's like huge posters up of meet this author here, and this author's doing that, and there's like lines for some authors and others that were just, you know, standing around going like, you know, hi, um, <laughs> and it, it really made me feel, I mean, and it would also, like, I'll just be honest, it, that was right after the Dobbs ruling from the Supreme oh Court. Oh my gosh, we're yes. in Washington, D.C. when the ruling comes out about Roe versus Wade. <gasps> like, we had a conversation, right. um, and uh, Valerie right. and Jen, who were with me, who worked with my publishing company, because we did a, a talk there at ALA, which is why we were mm -hmm. there, right. right, about the changing in the fantasy and science fiction genres, but we turned it in into, hi, librarians, what do you want from books? Like, what is not being done yeah. for you? And just took away a whole list of things that they wanted changed and immediately know. went and redid all of our books. So they had all these changes in them. But um, so, and our library sales have gone up like six times what they were because of that. So go us. Mm -hmm. But it happened. And I was like, besides being so thoroughly angered and thinking it is impossible that we're going in this direction, right? I keep saying yes. that to myself, then it happens. So I've been instructed mm -hmm. like the Ireland thing to stop saying that because apparently then it happens. Manifested. But I was like, are we going to need to leave? Like yeah. we're in Washington, DC when this is happening. Yeah. Should, yeah. you know, That's are good. we going to um, not contribute to the motion that needs to be here right now by being yeah. a good point yeah no exactly and i so i i talked i talked on i gave a present so I, we met on the sunday and i gave a talk on saturday and then again on monday morning and going into saturday i was so i mean my own my brain was still just reeling with everything and i'm like you know, world's ending who cares about empathy i'm this one tiny author with this like sea of authors and books God, who's going to come hear me talk because I'm first time, you know, all of that. And I have to say, I was so moved and touched and I, I, I owe such a debt to the um, librarians and those that showed up because we ended up, I ended up like, people didn't leave from the talk that was happening before they, they stuck around and I was like, that's weird. Maybe they're taking a break. And then more showed up and more, they were sitting on the floor. And just to oh. stand on that stage and to look and see the sea of faces of people that were so interested in learning about empathy and how to practice empathy and you know, bring empathy into their communities, because that's what I was talking about, was like creating programs that foster empathy within the library, because I do believe, I mean, books, obviously, are, are such a powerful tool to build that empathy muscle. And then libraries, they're a center, you know, meeting place, a center point within a community and they do programming and they have an opportunity to introduce people to new thoughts, new perspectives. And, you know, how can they 
you know, play a greater role um, in doing that, or at least be aware of the power that they have and the opportunity that they have to make a difference. And so I, I, it, it honestly, like it renewed my hope and faith in humanity. Like, okay, there are people out here that want to make the world a better place. And that, you know, they, you could just tell they were not happy about what happened um, with Dobbs and all the other things. And it, it was, it was beautiful. Um, that is amazing. amazing. Very amazing. Yeah. And I think a great point to end this wonderful episode. So Rob, shameless self-promotion time, because I think your book is so critical right now. How do mm -hmm. people find it and you to do speaking or seminars? How do we find this? Yes, uh, you can find me by going to five steps to empathy.com. It's the number five and then steps to empathy.com. Um, and then through there, you'll find ways to, to reach me. I'll, I'll email links and that kind of come back in my direction. Um, the book is available wherever people prefer to order books, whether that's Amazon or their favorite indie, or they want to read it at the library. Um, libraries are carrying it as well. Can I hold up a copy of it? You can hold up. Yes. There it Please. is. Tell me more about that. Solving the empathy crisis, one conversation at a time. I love it. I love, love it. it. I love it. Rob, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Oh, Eric and Danielle, this has been so wonderful. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Love Absolutely. This. Okay. So this has been Drinking with Authors. I've been your host, Erica Lance, and my amazing co-host, Danielle Orsino. Please like and subscribe and leave us a review on all major platforms because we know you have so much to say. And our guest has been Rob Volpe, and we will see you guys next time. Yay. Yay.